Right, so let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. Great excuse to spend a week in Berkeley, and quite happy to talk about some fairly recent work today on parallel active learning. This is joint work with uh, Leon Batu, Miroslav Dudik, and John Langford at Microsoft Research. Uh, so let me start by giving some motivation for uh, the, the direction we're, we're exploring in, in this work. This is going to be a talk about um, distributed machine learning. So uh, b in order to motivate it, uh, I'm going to very briefly say a few words about many existing distributed machine learning approaches. I'm going to do, do so without naming any names, because how the people in this room have either worked on some algorithms of this nature or are good friends with somebody who has. So you know this work already. Um, so there's, there's quite a few distributed machine learning approaches that are out there at this point. Um, a lot of them often work by parallelizing existing algorithms. So a lot of works around distributed optimization would say fall into this category. Often the existing algorithms don't parallelize sort of as is, but you have to uh, change some things around. So uh, uh, an example could be something like distributed mini batches. Um, and then there are a variety of other approaches, such as bagging or model averaging, which try to somewhat recognize the fact that maybe this is not an arbitrary computational problem, but we're trying to actually at heart address a statistical problem when we are doing distributed machine learning. And maybe there, there is something uh, we can you know, do simple on individual machines and then aggregate information somehow, um, and so on. And so there's a good number of such approaches. And well, uh, let me start by maybe outlining a couple of implicit assumptions or, uh, or uh, limitations that are often present in these approaches, then the, and then we can think about how we might improve the state of the art by uh, relaxing these further. So uh, one kind of, I would say, implicit or explicit assumption in a lot of the existing approaches is that the model that we are trying to learn is relatively parsimonious. So it's uh, simple to communicate in a cheap fashion, or if not the model directly, maybe the gradients in an optimization framework can be communicated in a cheap way. There are things like, if you're doing something like model averaging, then, uh, or, or, then things like um, averaging have to make sense to begin with and have to be sound. And we're going to see more about uh, in, in, in the next slide when these sorts of simple assumptions can fail. Another um, thing that's some, sometimes a little bothersome is that the statistical structure of the problem, really, you know, when, when we're doing distributed machine learning, it's not like there is uh, just an arbitrary computational problem that we are solving. There is, there is data, and there is some structure to it. Uh, and often, the, uh, we, we ignore this structure while designing distributed machine learning algorithms. We're not very careful about it. Maybe we use the fact that the data is IID across different machines sometimes, but not much more than that. And maybe we can do better if we think more carefully about the properties of uh, this data that we're dealing with. So let me start with um, the, 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 the first limitation that I mentioned, which is the models might not always be parsimoniously described. So perhaps the, the easiest to see example here is if you're working with something that's somewhat non-parametric uh, as your learning algorithm. So for instance, if you're doing a kernel method, such as a kernel support vector machine, then in order to describe your model, you need not just you know, a simple vector of weights or something, but you also need to have your data points, your training data, or some subset of your training data with you in order to meaningfully describe the model. Now, if you want to communicate the model, that means you're also going to be communicating a lot of data. Um, and this, this is, of course, not just limited to uh, kernel SVMs, but if you're doing things like nearest neighbors or any other kernel methods, or even a high-dimensional linear model, um, you have to think twice before you talk about communication of a model or the gradient of a model. So, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, the second thing to keep in mind is things like model averaging can fail in simple ways. So uh, consider a very common example of matrix factorization that arises in contexts of recommendation systems, uh, sparse coding, or a variety of other applications. Um, now for a matrix M, uv is a good factorization. Minus u minus v is a good factorization. You average the two, you get 0. So uh, you have to be careful when you model average. And this is not a one-off. It is fairly generic when your model rep representation is non-convex in the parameters. Um, 
no matter how hard we try to avoid this, these problems do come up every now and then. Um, things like neural networks, mixture models, and many other representations have these issues. So it's something worth thinking about and saying, can we have a method that's robust to failure modes such as uh, these mentioned here? Now, the second part, of course, when you talk about having large quantities of data, we have a lot of data, but do we really need all the data? So, so Sergey talked very uh, nicely about uh, these issues in the morning um, in context of uh, core sets, and this, this problem kind of fairly generically arises also in distributed machine learning. So for instance, uh, here, you know, we're, we're just, this is a very cartoon example, we're trying to distinguish between the red circles and the blue squares, and we're just trying to do it via linear classifier, and of course, given this data, it's pretty obvious that this black line is a good classifier, but of course, if I gave you just these six green points instead of all the remaining data, you would probably still come up with the same black line. And if somebody gave these six points to us in advance, then our computational problem would be fantastically simple. Right? And this is essentially the intuition that's used in um, uh, support vector machines where we, or where we maybe try to find these six green points. Um, and in fact, uh, exploiting this has been looked at in works for in existing works for parallelizing uh, kernel SVMs, as well as more generically in the context of um, uh, computational complexity by Nina and co-authors, uh, and by uh, Haldom and co-authors, and uh, we're gonna see a bit of this in Nina's talk tomorrow, I believe. Um, so there is, there is a generic way, by the way, of describing this, uh, this situation that we, we saw before, this uh, you know, intuition of a few number of informative data points, this can be captured fairly broadly. There's a whole field around it called active learning, which essentially tries to solve this precise problem, go over a large collection of data, try to find the examples that are most informative towards the statistical problem at hand, and um, then use them for learning. And this is a similar idea as support vectors, but works a lot more broadly. And the nice thing is that at this point, we have efficient algorithms or in many cases, more, even more efficient heuristics to solve this, uh, th these, this sort of a question for many generic hypothesis classes, loss functions, uh, and, and so on. Right? So a simple example of this would be maybe, uh, so if we are doing binary classification and um, we receive a data point x, we have a current classifier h of x and we are trying to predict uh, plus one or minus one based on the sign of h of x, then a pretty uh, generic form of rule here often is that you look at the absolute value of h of x. If it's large, then we are very confident in our prediction. You know, we are going to sample this point x with a small probability. If it's close to zero, then we are going to sample this point with a large probability. Um, or you could, for instance, look at a data point x, look at its similarities with the points you've queried in the past, and design a, a querying rule uh, based on this similarity. Easy examples of both are uh, known in the literature. So, so this is one primitive that kind of tries to maybe exploit, uh, allows us to exploit the statistical structure of the problem somewhat more carefully, and maybe we can use this uh, to inform our distributed machine learning algorithms somehow. Okay, so here's a very simple idea of how one might go about doing that. Um, <coughs> so we have, a, we have a cluster of computers, each gray uh, box here denotes a, denotes a computer in a cluster. The computer has some local data set on local storage, which it has access to. Um, now, what it tries to do in parallel, each computer goes over the local data and tries to find out the informative examples using some, for instance, active learning algorithm. Um, it takes the informative ones and communicates them to all the other nodes in the cluster and then uh, each node takes the collection of all the informative examples that were found by anybody here and updates the model locally. And the intuition is that the total number of informative examples that you might find is fairly small across everything. So once you've found them, then doing the model update locally is probably not too expensive. Okay, so this is fairly simple intuition. Uh, you can turn it into an algorithm fairly easily. So let's see a synchronous instantiation of an algorithm that does this. So 
what we have is we start from some initial hypothesis H1. We have some fixed batch size B. We have two algorithms, algorithmic primitives we are going to assume for now. So there is an active learning algorithm which we call a sifter A. And there is a passive updater P. I'm going to, again, give concrete examples of these in a couple of minutes um, on the slide. So uh, basically, the algorithm proceeds in rounds. At each round, you take, uh, you look at B examples in parallel. So each node, each of the K nodes look at, looks at B over K examples locally and uses the active sifter locally to create a subsample data set of a certain size. Um, and then these uh, selected examples are broadcast over the network. And now each node locally can update, go from HT to HT plus one by running the passive updater P on the subsample data, on the selected data. Right, so a bit more concretely, for instance, you could be doing this, say, for kernel SVMs. HT would be your current kernel SVM solution at time T based on whatever subsample data you've seen so far. Um, maybe you use this a query rule based on the uh, absolute value of HT of X uh, to create the subsample data on each node, share this over the network, and then you go from HT to HT plus one by using an online kernel SVM update rule on the subsample data, and there are a few examples of how to do this uh, again. That I'll be happy to describe to you. You can make this uh, asynchronous fairly easily. Um, so the idea is almost the same, except you don't really, um, sorry, I shouldn't really have a batch size B here anymore. That's for the synchronous. So now you do something very simple. You take each node and you basically attach two queues to each node. One queue is going to be a queue of selected examples that have been identified as informative by some node in the network. And another queue is going to be examples that are waiting to be processed by the active sifter. So while you have selected examples available to you, you keep on updating your hypothesis by using these examples. At some point, maybe you run out of them. At that point, you turn to your local data and start sifting through your local data till you find some informative examples again. And whenever you find one, you broadcast, you add it to the queue of every node in the network. You just do a broadcast. It's so fairly simple again. So we can uh, reason a little bit about the computational complexity of a procedure like this. I'm going to define some simple primitives to help us reason about it. So we're going to assume that the computational complexity of, a, of our passive updater P is T of n. So it, it takes n examples, and it time T of n spits out a model. So then uh, this, is, this is the running time that we're going to have for the sequential passive algorithm running on one machine. Now, in order to look at the communication complexity, uh, computational complexity of active learning, we need uh, a little bit more notation. Uh, but it's, uh, it's fairly simple. We'll parse it together. So you, we define a quantity S of n, which is roughly, think about it as the complexity of a model trained on n examples. So if you take a model that has been trained on n examples and use it to predict on a fresh example x, then it's going to take you time S of n. Okay, so if, uh, for predict, for after training on 10 examples, you have a uh, it takes you S of 10 time to predict on a new example. Uh, we also assume that the active sifter, if it gets N examples, it's going to subsample a set of size phi of N. Okay, then the, the, roughly the pipeline that we might have for a sequential active approach that's similar to our parallel approach would be you, you put n examples through here. You get phi of n out here. These phi of n are processed by the passive updater. And uh, in time t of phi n, it spits out a model. And now, how much time do we spend in the active, active learning algorithm? Well, this depends on the active learning algorithm being used. But a fairly generous estimate is to say that the complexity of active learning is maybe the same as the complexity of computing a prediction. And in order to do that, you evaluate the model, which will have a complexity now S of phi n, because you're, you're computing the model with you just phi of n examples. Remember, there is a constant back and forth between these. So your model never has a complexity more than S of phi n, and you're computing it on about n examples, because each example goes into the active sector. So this is going to be 
n times s of phi n is the complexity uh, roughly of the active learning part, and then t of phi n is the complexity of the passive updater. So that's the net time complexity of sequential active. And now what happens when we deploy this in parallel is basically we are going to look at the n examples, not sequentially, but in parallel. So each node is just going to, each sifter is only going to go over n over k examples. And hence, the first part of the complexity goes from n, n times s to n times s over k. So, so, so this is the part where you gain from going sequential to parallel, and the second part remains the same. Now, um, if we want to think about where, what might be the ordering between these things uh, looking like, we can instantiate these uh, uh, with uh, specific examples. So for instance, we can take the example of a kernel SVM. So if you use a good algorithm, you might hope to have a Tn of about On square. Um, S of n usually grows linearly with n. The number of support vectors in uh, here usually grows linearly with the number of data points. For a good day for these techniques is when you find phi of n to be much, much smaller than n. That's where active learning is doing something non-trivial. Um, and plugging this in the expression for s of n, we see that t, t of n is already much, much larger than n times s of phi n, because t n is n times n, s of phi n is n times phi n, which is much smaller than t of n. And then we get a further speed up, dividing this by k when we go from uh, sequential to parallel. So what we see in the kernel SVM example is that when we go from passive to active, we already get a computational speed up, and then we get another computational speed up when we go to parallel. Um, we can look at a different setting. So um, if you do um, an example of a non-convex model I was talking about before, like a neural net with uh, back propagation. So here, Tn is just linear in the number of examples, usually. And Sn does not depend on the number of examples, because the model has a fixed complexity. It just depends on the number of parameters you're learning. Um, we still hope that V of n is much, much smaller than n. But in this case, what we see is that in, in sequential setting, we don't get any gain from going from passive to active, because this is order n, this is order n. What we still hope to get is a reduction here when we go from sequential to parallel, which will cut down one term here, and this term is still order phi n, so it's hopefully much, much smaller than this term, which is order n. Right? So at least roughly we hope that still going from uh, sequential to sequential does not give us something, but sequential to parallel still gives us something non-trivial. Um, so uh, the rounds of communication really depend on, I guess, um, the batch size that you're using uh, relative to the number of examples. So um, this, in some sense, is a hyperparameter that you can play with, right? But at a high level, the communication complexity of the algorithm, which you're really alluding to, depends on the query complexity of the underlying active learning uh, approach. And I'm going to leave it to you tomorrow to say most of the things about it. There's only one remark I want to make here. So one thing we have to be careful about is that, so typically we assume in active learning, that when we do query complexity kind of analysis, that uh, we, we see an example, we decide whether we're going to query the label or not. And if we decide, we, we see the label and update our model basically immediately. Whereas now we don't. So again, uh, if we go to the concrete slide here, we go over a batch of size B, collect all the examples that seem informative, and update the model after we've collected these examples. So there is a delay of about B here uh, between deciding whether an example is informative and then updating the model. And this, this might actually be dangerous because this might mean that the query complexity of Active learning goes up by a lot when we do this, and this is bad for communication complexity. So uh, thankfully, this is not the case. So we, we, have, we have some analysis for uh, a special, uh, for at least an example of active learning rule. And I know it's true for at least a couple of others, where 
this delay is not too harmful. What you can show is that if phi of n was the subsampling rate without delays, then with delays, it's just about t plus phi of n minus, uh, tau plus phi of n minus tau. So it's, it's not too catastrophic at all. In fact, I, I would say that the behavior of the asynchronous version with delays here is much nicer almost than what we would expect to have, say, with uh, the usual distributed optimization kind of algorithms we are more familiar with. OK, so in the remaining time, I want to say a little bit about the experimental evaluation uh, that we did for this algorithm. So uh, I'm going to describe one simulation and one experiment. Um, both of them were done with uh, a handwritten digit recognition data set, uh, MNIST, but was not the standard data set. It was an enlarged version of the data set created by Leon Boutou, uh, which takes the original digits and does some elastic deformations of, this, of them and results in about 8.1 million examples. Uh, we did a simulation for kernel SVM. Um, and this was with an RBF kernel, used an online kernel SVM algorithm. Uh, we did a, a parallel implementation of uh, single hidden layer neural nets. The active learning rule was fairly simple, selecting point x with probability based on the absolute value of the current classifier in such a way that the subsampling rate is something we like to have for communication. Uh, so for the first, for the simulation, here is how we did it. We basically simulated synchronous pair active learning. So we fix a batch size b, split into portions of size b, of, b over k, sift each portion in turn, take the largest splitting, uh, sifting time, then we update the model with, new exam with, these, uh, with the selected examples, take the training time to update the model, and use the sum of these two as an, as an approximation of the parallel computation time. So what we are ignoring here is the communication time. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's actually in the experiments I've done so far, the communication time seems fairly, uh, fairly controllable. So I don't think this is a particular issue. So um, what we see is for the kernel SVMs, the improvements were actually quite, quite nice, quite striking. Um, I'm going to completely skip this plot and look, look at the more interpretable plot, which is, uh, which is speed ups. So, um, so the task here we were looking at was uh, classifying the pair of digits 1, one 3 versus 5, 7. This is, uh, fairly, uh, fairly comp th th this is one of the more difficult subproblems within MNIST. And we were measuring the speed up over running the sequential passive algorithm. With respect to the number of nodes, for, a, for different, different uh, amount of tester, and these, these are test, tester numbers over, um, I think, about 4,000 test examples. Um, so what we see is that we do get speed ups, and the speed ups are more pronounced when we look at uh, smaller error rates, because that means we are essentially looking into later and later iterations of the algorithm. So the, the algorithm basically gets to run for longer and the, 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 hence the speed up usually gets more pronounced when you do that. And um, it, is, it is reasonably, the, so the dotted black line here would be a linear speed up, and what we see is the speed up does seem fairly close to linear often, and eventually it starts to taper out around 100 nodes or so. Rob? I was going to ask, does the, does the batch size stay the same and you just change k here? <coughs> yes, batch yes, batch yes, yes. Batch size stays the same and we change k. Um, is that, is that was so here I just used about thousand per class, or uh, no, actually it was sixty thousand. So it, it was six. Uh, it was about six thousand per class. Sorry. Uh, no, thousand thousand per class. My, <laughs> sorry. So so yeah, I, I just used thousand per class. Uh, I didn't I didn't play. Much with that. Um, so, but when you change a hundred, then you have about ten percent of right, more. right. So, so yeah. So, if I, if I, when I, when I actually run this on the cluster, I would probably um, use. Um, so, a rule of thumb I use when I try to run this on the cluster is, you essentially for whatever batch size you're using, maybe one good. Uh, so the simplest thing to try is if you have k nodes, just use a, ba a batch size of k squared. So each node finds one out of k. That 
looks relevant, and then you find k out of k squared. And this seems to work reasonably well without so far uh, being, being too uh, computationally expensive. But, but again, this is something that you can easily play with uh, once you have the implementation. Okay, the, the, other, the other kind of obvious benchmark to look at here is, okay, sure, we get some improvement over passive, but in kernel SVMs, we saw that actually active is already doing better than passive, so maybe the, the gain is entirely due to using active learning and not due to using parallel learning. Thankfully, that's not the case, and when we plot the speed up over sequential active, the speed ups are lesser, but still there and still near linear uh, up until about 100 nodes. Um, the story with neural nets is less exciting. With the, the, the extent of speed ups here is less. Uh, I think that's partly because of the linear complexity of uh, uh, running time complexity. Everything just ends very quickly, and there is not enough uh, room to uh, room to do speed ups. But what what we do see is initially the error definitely drops much faster for using. Uh, parallel active learning, but uh, e eventually they all start to look about the same, and uh, there, there isn't that much we're able to gain by it. So, so here, I, I think it seems really worthwhile to actually experiment with larger data sets where um, neural nets have larger running times, and we're playing around with some data sets of that form now. But Nina is showing me that I'm more or less out of time, so I should wrap up here. Um, I think at a high level, this seems like a fairly nice general strategy for distributed machine learning, um, primarily because it seems to be applicable to slightly more diverse set of hypothesis classes and algorithms than maybe some of the existing approaches. It's particularly ap appealing for non-parametric and non-convex models that have maybe not received as much attention before, and all in all, it seems theoretically reasonably well-motivated and uh, empirically fairly promising. So in terms of uh, going forward, we would like to also do a real distributed implementation for kernel SVMs at least, and maybe for some other algorithms, evaluate things on more data sets, and maybe use different subsampling strategies and so on. But in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop here and happy to take any questions. <laughs>